The following message is brought to you by Christian Sermons Online. Broadcasting Christ-centered messages around the world 24 hours a day. Check us out at christiansermonsonline.com. The World Outreach Partners and Friends of the Jimmy Swaggart Ministries invite you to join us for this next hour of praise and worship with evangelist Jimmy Swaggart as he boldly proclaims the message of power and hope that Jesus Christ changes lives. Experience the uplifting spirit of anointed gospel music that will fill your heart and the dynamic preaching of God's Word that will reveal to you, as it does to thousands every week, the reality of new life in Jesus Christ. As never before, people around the world are being touched. Through the weekly and daily television programs, which are translated into numerous languages, Worldwide Crusades, where thousands are being saved, through a well-rounded children's outreach and the work of missionaries, through the printing and distribution of literature, by training Christian leaders in many countries, and by building churches to reach more people with the truth. We pray that God touches your heart with this message and brings you into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. On today's program, from our giant citywide crusade in Boston, Massachusetts, evangelist Jimmy Swaggart reveals the dangerous trends which are undermining our society's strengths in his message entitled, God's Lawsuit Against America. So come along with us now as we join the thousands already gathered in the Boston Gardens, Boston, Massachusetts, as today's service begins. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me, please. To the book of Hosea. I feel that this message, God ordained this be the place that it would be preached. And I would ask that hundreds of you that are seated here tonight, that know God deeply and everlastingly, would subconsciously pray for us as we minister. I feel it's that important. Hosea chapter 4 beginning with the first word of the first verse. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. The scripture could be easily paraphrased and stated, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye children of America. It could go the same for every country that's getting this telecast. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Now remember, he was speaking here of his chosen people. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn. I'll close it in the middle of that, or at the beginning of that third verse. Because there is no knowledge, no truth, no mercy, because the land is filled with swearing and lying and killing and stealing and adultery, blood touching blood, therefore the land mourns. I want to use for a subject tonight God's lawsuit against America. The word controversy in the Hebrew means lawsuit. God has a legal entity against the United States of America. As Israel was the covenant nation, I believe the United States of America has been and is today the covenant nation of the world. I believe that. And because of these sins, God has a lawsuit against this country. The same as if though the judge of the ages would stand in a court of law and would accuse as an attorney the people. God's lawsuit against America. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, as we minister tonight, we realize how utterly dependent we are upon Thee. 
We would ask that you would help us that our tongue would become as the pen of a ready writer, our lips as flames of fire. Anoint the people, dear God. Anoint those for television. Help them to understand, to realize the pregnancy, the significance, the poignancy of the moment. And I'll ask it all in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen. Years ago, Billy Graham made a statement that August evangelist that has been repeated over and over again and bears repeating even more. He said, if God does not judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That is true. Jesus said when he looked at Capernaum, where he had made his headquarters, if the miracles, Capernaum, that had been done in thee had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I feel tonight strongly, I sense it, I don't say it for controversial matters, I do not say it to be a speaker of gloom, but I say it because I sense it and I believe God tells me say it, and it's this, that this country is on the razor edge of judgment. The seeds have already been sown. It's well on its way to the fruit becoming rotten, the seed rotting in the ground, with all the terrible calamities that follow a nation that's known God and then turns their back on God, receiving the wrath and the judgment of God. America has known judgment only one time in history. And that was a little over a hundred years ago when civil war swept this nation. Almost as many men were killed in the civil war as all the other wars fought by the United States put together. They tell us there was not in this horrible, hideous bloodletting a family that was not touched in one way or the other by this hideous conflict, but we tend to forget. And why did that judgment come upon this nation? It came upon it because America was breaking the laws of God so badly in the realm of treating its fellow man as if though they were animals and not human beings, and I speak of slavery. Abraham Lincoln stood in New Orleans, Louisiana as a young man and watched black men and women stand on a slave block with iron manacles on their feet and on their arms, treated like animals and treated like cattle. Abraham Lincoln stood there with tears rolling down his cheeks and made a vow to God. He said, God, if you will help me and give me the strength, I give you my word, I will smite this cancer in the United States of America if you help me do it. Now, I want to show you something. The similarity is so near, so close, that it's chilling. In 1857, over 100 years ago, concerning slavery, the United States Supreme Court, in essence, said these words. Although he meaning the black man and the black woman, may have a heart and a brain, and he may be a human life biologically, a slave is not a legal person. The Dred Scott decision by the United States Supreme Court has made that clear. Come up now to present. Look at abortion. The words are almost the same. The Supreme Court says, Although he may have a heart and a brain, and he may be a human life biologically, an unborn baby is not a legal person, the United States Supreme Court has made that clear. 
It's chilling. Go back to 1857 again. They said, a black man only becomes a legal person when he is set free. Before that time, we should not concern ourselves about him because he has no legal right. Come up to this present day. The Supreme Court says a baby only becomes a legal person when he is born. Before that time, we should not concern ourselves about him because he has no legal rights. Listen to it. Go back. If you think that slavery is wrong, then nobody is forcing you to be a slave owner. But don't impose your morality on somebody else. Come up to this present day. If you think abortion is wrong, then nobody is forcing you to have one. But don't force your morality on somebody else. Go back. A man has a right to do what he wants with his property. Speaking of slaves, come up to now. A woman has a right to do what she wants with her own body. One more time, go back. Isn't slavery really something merciful, the Supreme Court said in that day? After all, every black man has a right to be protected. Isn't it better never to be set free than to be sent unprepared and ill-equipped into a cruel world? Come up to now. Isn't abortion really something merciful? After all, every baby has a right to be wanted. Isn't it better to never be born than to be sent alone and unloved into a cruel world? History repeats itself. The new United States of America is trotting the same path that it trod over a hundred years ago. The cruelty, the inhumanity to man, the sin is just as repugnant in the nostrils of God tonight as it was that day that Abraham Lincoln stood there so long, long ago. God said in his holy word when he spoke to Israel that day in the distant past, he said, there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Why is that? We come up today to the great United States of America. We go back to the age of innocence of this country, 19, the 1950s. In the 1950s, the four R's were the basics, not the three, the four, were the basics of our rudimentary educational efforts in the United States. Those four R's were reading, writing, arithmetic, and righteousness. But something has happened in the United States of America. It started back in the 1930s. A man by the name of John Dewey, a socialist humanist, helped foment humanism in our public school system. And this philosophy of secular humanism, now listen to me, America. Listen to me, Canada. Listen to me, every nation in the world. This religion, and that's what it is, this philosophy, religious philosophy, called secular humanism, has raped the minds of millions of our children. And it has helped make the United States of America the cesspool of iniquity that we are in today. I want to read you something from Adolf Hitler's history. In the early 1930s, a determined group of opinion makers in Germany began to, re to promote a new ethic. It was called the pragmatic morality of Heichel. Heichel was the German philosopher. 
And here was the heart of his philosophy that he began to promote in the schools of Germany. He said, whatever solves a problem on the practical level must be considered moral. This is situational ethics. It's humanism. No action is right or wrong in itself. If a given action results in a desirable effect, it is ethically accepted. The schools of Germany embrace that philosophy in its elementary and high schools and even in its colleges and universities, and it set the platform for Hitler's Germany. The educational and the judicial systems began to lean in this direction. And when Hitler could no longer be successfully opposed, he set up the killing sinners. Hitler ordered the deaths of the insane, the aged and stayed homes, the retarded and the deformed. Their crime was that they could not contribute and they were no longer practical, therefore it was moral to eliminate them for the benefit of the state. They were not wanted or needed, so they were killed. Now the Supreme Court of the United States of America is preaching this exact same philosophy, 100%. Here is what secular humanism is. And our educational research analyst, this was culled from materials, and listen to me, being widely used in our American schools. This is what they said. To truly induce completely creative thinking, we should teach children to question the Ten Commandments. We should teach children to question patriotism and laws against incest. And this gym, to be a better citizen, a person needs to learn how to apply for welfare and to burn the American flag. This is what is being taught your school children, America. This is the manifesto of secular humanism. They said, we find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of the survival and fulfillment of the human race. As non-theists, they say, we begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. No deity, they say, will save us. We must save ourselves. Well, if they're saving themselves, they're making a mess of it. They said, promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. There is no credible evidence that life survives the death of the body, they said. Traditional religions are surely not the only obstacles to human progress, but they said we affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics, they said, is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Ethics stems from human need and human interest. That is situational ethics. This is what is being taught our children in our school systems. They say they're going to do this. They will eliminate the absolutes of God. They will eliminate the absolutes of his word through humanistic education. They will replace old ethics with new ethics. They will eliminate the value of life with new ethics. Notice the terminology. Eliminate the value of life with new ethics. It's already started in the United States. If a baby is born and it's not quite perfect, the proposal is being suggested to the public, do away with it. 
get another one. You girls that are listening to me in this audience tonight, you're being told that an abortion is simple, requires nothing of you, it's over in a short time, you should not feel bad about it. That's the biggest lie that ever came out of hell. Now, I want to bear down on that because I feel that I must. If you have an abortion, the chances of your next child being born perfect is lessened considerably. The chances of a premature birth of your next baby, one that you really want, has increased considerably because of that first abortion. Our schools are being filled today with babies that are born prematurely and their brain is not quite developed and they will be retarded for life, a lot of it because of a previous abortion. All right, listen. The Bible teaches us, and I pray God that doctors and nurses are listening. I pray God that the Supreme Court is listening. The Bible teaches us that life begins at conception. Do you hear that? Life begins at conception. Do you realize tonight that only 18 days, lady, young girl, after you become pregnant, only 18 days after conception, the baby's heart is beating. Do you know that? Do you know that only 43 days after you become pregnant that brain waves are traceable in that little baby's brain? Do you realize that during the sixth and the seventh weeks that nerves and muscles begin working together and the baby's lips become sensitive to gentle touch? Do you know that at eight weeks he squints and his little fingers close into a fist if his palm is touched? We're talking about human life, not a blob, not a mass, but a human being. By the 11th week, all internal organs are present and functioning. He breathes, swallows, digests. He's very sensitive to pain. He recalls from a pin prick, noise, heat, cold. After the 11th week, nothing new will develop or function or be added only further growth and maturation or maturity. Now, when an abortion itself is performed by a so-called specialist in a hospital, if the baby has lived for 12 weeks or less, the suction cooterage is used frequently. If it's after 11 or 12 weeks, after three months, a strong saline solution may be injected into the fluid surrounding him that burns because it's like fire. He fights for his life in vain, and he's pushed out of the womb dead. Sometimes the larger babies are removed from the mother's abdomen by a hysterotomy. It's like a cesarean operation. The umbilical cord is cut when he is born, which is his lifeline, and then he's laid into a basin, and he struggles gasping for air, but he's too young to live without help. So eventually his heart gives out, and he stops breathing, and he dies. I want to say something. I want to speak to the doctors and nurses that would have so few scruples that you would for money, money, money that would submit your talents that God has given you not to save life but to kill it. Doctor, nurse, you, your hands are as guilty of 
blood as Pony as Pilate, and you can never wash them away as he tried to wash away the blood. 2,000 years ago, they drip with human blood, and you are guilty of murder, and you will stand before God one day and answer for the murder of thousands, even tens of thousands of human beings. No knowledge of God in the land. Somebody said, I cannot really see how this hurts us to bring, just to eliminate the bringing of unwanted children into the world. Listen to me. Every nation that has had liberal abortion, infanticide has increased in that nation meaning the murder of babies after they're born because they don't look right. Child abuse has increased and little human life becomes cheap because you see, when you have no mercy or concern for one segment of society, sin will always spread to other segments of society. No mercy, no law. No knowledge of God in the land. And God Almighty looks and loves that little unborn baby just as much as he loves any human being on the face of this earth. And there is no knowledge of God in the land. Lawlessness takes over the land. He said, swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, blood touching blood. Look about you. The United States of America today has become the murder, the murder nation of the world. Our cities have become animal crawling jungles. Murder is commonplace in the land. He used the term swearing, lying, swearing. Now, it seems that a constant stream of gutter filth spews from the mouths of men and women. Conversation laced with obscenities, vulgarities, profanity. Women, not ladies, women. You turn on your television, set the hells, the dams, the filth, the vulgarity spews out of it. <laughs> swearing, 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 lying. Then he said, murder. Let me tell you this. You see, our laws have gradually left the laws of the Word of God. This is the law. You go against this law, you have destroyed the principles of all that is right, noble, and good. What I'm going to say will not be appreciated, will not be respected in many circles. Professors that you're Harvard University, if some would be listening, would laugh at this as a throwback to the antediluvian age, they would say. But this book is always as modern as tomorrow. It never gets old. And God's Word says, if you shed man's blood by cold-blooded murder, by man shall your blood be shed. Do you know the reason that it's not safe to walk down many streets and many cities at night, sometimes even in the daytime in certain areas of cities? You know why? You know why store after store has had to be boarded up in bars like a prison? Today, the good, honest people are behind bars and the criminals are walking free. You hear me? If I walked up on a little girl being beaten by a bully, a little five, six-year-old girl, and this 200-pound bully is, is beating her to death, and I'm a Christian, 
what do I do? Do I anoint him with oil? What do I do? Do I pat him on the shoulder and say, I love you? He'll think I'm crazy and a child will know I'm crazy. I don't know what about him, but that baby's dying. No, you may not like it. Some of you may look at me and think you're not much of a Christian, but I'm going to tell you what I would do. I would look for me the biggest club I could find and I would try to part his hair. That's what I would do. You say, that's not Christian. Yes, it is. When a man in cold-blooded murder takes the life of another individual wantonly, that individual ought to pay for his crime according to the Word of God by dying in an electric chair or on a hangman's noose or in a gas chamber. And the individuals that try to tell us that it does not deter crime or wrong, you are fools because it does deter crime. This Bible says it does. Child abuse in the land. One of the most dreaded, vile, rotten, hellish crimes that comes about because of the rot I've been telling you about. One crime leads to another crime. Young life is cheap. A little girl the other day, her lips split wide open and bleeding and huddled in the corner. When the police broke in to try to get her, she was trembling and shaking, and they picked her up to take her out. And she looked at her mama and said, Mama, if I die, will you love me then? There is no love. No love. When you depart from this book, there's no love left. There's no love. Young people, listen to me. You can lay in the back seat of a car on the grassy strip of some city park somewhere or some motel or hotel room and indulge in illicit sex and you can call it love, but it's not love. It has absolutely nothing to do with love. And that's one of the reasons today that this nation is in the shape that it's in. It's not love. The smarmy, ridiculous attitudes of a nation gone astray. It's not love. They don't know what love is. The only love one can know is through Jesus Christ. Then you'll know what real love is. And you love your neighbor as yourself. drunkenness and drugs. When a man or a woman climbs behind the wheel of an automobile drinking, you hear me? And that man or woman runs into somebody and kills them, they ought to be tried for murder. You say, that's hard, Jimmy Swaggart. No, it's not hard. It's not hard. It's not hard at all. It's the truth. It ought, they ought to be tried for murder because that automobile becomes a lethal weapon. Drugs, drunkenness. I want to read you something. It is so, it is so sickening that it's, it's, it's hard to digest it. Listen to this. The sex life of Jesus is soon to be a movie. British filmmaker David Grant will reportedly come to the United States next year to shoot one of the most controversial movies of all time. The film will be based on Danish screenwriter Jens Jorgen Thorson's much publicized script, The Sex Life of Jesus. The play portrays Jesus Christ as engaging in homosexual relationships. 
According to the current schedule, the one and two tenths million dollar production will be filmed in the new United States early next year if a book based on the script is well received before then. The book is scheduled for release in the new United States during the Christmas holidays. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you this. When this nation commits one act of transgression after the other, they come closer and closer and closer. But when they start to stand before God, you hear me? When they start to stand before God Almighty, with the most licentious, rotten filth that hell can instigate or perpetrate. They're standing on the very razor edge of absolute destruction. You say, Jimmy Swaggart, how is it possible for this new United States of America to get itself in such a shape simply because they've gone away from the Word of God? God expects, listen to me, he expects the church of Jesus Christ in this nation to call this country back to repentance. He expects the preachers of the gospel, listen to me preachers, listen to me preachers, to stand behind pulpits and stand for something preachers. Preach the gospel. Preach it without fear. Preach it without favor. Preach it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Preach it with tears. Preach it with a broken heart. Preach it if your church throws you out in the street. Preach it if you lose your pension. Preach it if your denomination castigates you. Preach it if the priest throws you out. Preach it no matter what. And God will stand by your side for the power of heaven at your beck and call to anoint you with the mighty power of the Holy Ghost. Give us preachers like John the Baptist that will say, Thus saith the Lord. Because of the lack of knowledge of God in this land and lawlessness that fills the land, blood touching blood, there is mourning, draped mourning in this country. Listen, a nationwide survey of fourth graders in this United States estimated that half of their classmates had already become involved in the use of drugs. Fourth graders, nine and ten year olds. Fifty percent of the fourth graders in the United States of America taking drugs. Morning. Forty percent of all high school students smoke marijuana regularly. Think of it. 70% of all high school seniors drink regularly. And some begin as young as at the first grade. Morning in the land, morning. One third of all students under 12 admit to drug experimentation. Morning in the land. One out of three between the ages of 13 and 15 have had sexual intercourse. Think of that. Now listen to this. Morning in the land. 35,000 teenagers a year commit suicide. The major cause? Family problems, drug and alcohol abuse, and low self-esteem. They have no regard for themselves. And when man does not make Jesus the Lord of his life, man's worth becomes less and less and less and less. 
now. Morning in the land. Rome ruled the world for 1,500 long years. This mighty monolith in power when Jesus was born. Rome boasted that no enemy would ever see the heels of a Roman soldier. Mighty, powerful. The mighty phylax, the Roman legion, Pax Romana, Roman peace. Four things happened when Rome fell. It didn't happen in a day. No nation on the face of the earth could conquer Rome. They rotted from inward corruption, the same as this nation is doing today. Listen, Rome became totally enamored with four things. The first one was sports. America's God today is the basketball team, the baseball team, the football team, the hockey team. Second, fancy food. The greatest growth industry in the United States of America today is the restaurant business. We've got scores, thousands that don't have enough to eat and millions are spending $100, $150 on a meal. Fancy foods. Thirdly, amusement and pleasures. Turn on your television set. Strobe lights are rolling, glaring every color that one can think. Weird freaks. <laughs> are standing playing their punk rock or hype rock music. Channel after channel, station after station, representing the youth of the United States of America taken up with amusements and pleasure, pleasure and amusements. You are corrupting with spiritual fornication the youth of this nation for the love of dollar bills. And you in your ivory towers, in your skyscrapers in New York City and Los Angeles and Detroit and Chicago are going to answer to God Almighty for the rape of a nation. Rome fell when they became enamored with sports, fancy food, amusements and pleasures, homosexuality and divorce. Need I say more? This country is on the edge. And Jesus is standing at the door, knocking outside, trying to get in. The land of the brave, the home of the free. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Bow your heads, please. I thank you for mercy. I ask tonight I've done my best. I've delivered my soul to this people. And I know that you have a lawsuit against America. Bring us back, God. Bring us home. Bring us back to Calvary. Bring us back to the mourner's bench. Bring us back to the altars. Bring us back to righteousness. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Ladies and gentlemen, we're running out of time. The sands of the hourglass 
have almost run out. The hands on the clock are ticking close to the midnight hour. It's about over. You hear me? Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. How many of you in this vast audience of thousands tonight, you are away from God. You're not living right. You do not know Jesus. You've not made him the Lord of your life. Now listen carefully. Jimmy Swaggart, I'm not living right. Would you pray for me? And I'm speaking to you, but television as well. Now I want everyone to stand, please. Everybody stand. Neighbor, we'd better get right with God. The message said a storm is coming. You hear me? A storm is coming. We'd better get right. Time is running out. As they sing it, come on right now. Just have still coming. They're coming at the back. Those of you by television, hundreds and hundreds have walked these aisles to come to Jesus tonight here in Boston. What I'm going to say to them will be said to you. I want you to look at me, please, each one of you, for just a moment. The only source of life is in Jesus Christ. There is no other. But I will not lie to you to have what he will give you have to give him all that you have to give you understand if you mean business tonight you can take upon yourself a new life it is the only way that will bring fulfillment but he loves you I don't care who you are last week this time you may have been drunk you may be standing here tonight with liquor on your breath or drugs in your brain, but he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And he said, and you watching me for television, you might be sitting there with a can of beer in your hand, but he's touching you and you're under conviction. And it's time you set the beer down and came home to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. All right. I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. I want you to pray it with me. I want you to mean it with all that's in you. I want you to mean it with everything you have. And if you'll mean it with all that's within you, God will save you, cleanse you, wash every sin. 
and your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And there will be shouting in heaven tonight because you have come home. He said it, and I believe it. Now I want you to bow your heads, please, and I want you to close your eyes. Now let us pray. This will be the most important moment of your life. All over this nation, millions are praying for you right now, as well as those of you by television. Now let's pray. Dear God in heaven. Dear God in heaven. I come to you in Jesus' name. I come to you in Jesus' name. I'm tired of my old life. I'm tired of my old life. The hypocrisy. The hypocrisy. The sin. The sin. And the wickedness. And the wickedness. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I love you. I love you. Have mercy on my soul. Have mercy on my soul. According to your holy word. According to your holy word. Romans 10. Romans 10. Verses 9 and 10. With my, mouth, with my mouth, I confess, I confess Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ. In my heart, in my heart I, believe I believe that God raised Jesus, God raised Jesus from, the dead, from the dead, and he's alive. And he's alive. Right, now, right now, I ask Jesus, I ask Jesus to, come to come into my heart, and I accept him. As my, as my Savior, I'll do my best, do my best to, live to live for Him. According to His Word, to his word which, cannot lie, which cannot lie, right now, right now this, moment, this moment, I'm cleansed, I'm, cleansed, I'm, washed, I'm washed, I'm redeemed, I'm, redeemed, I'm, changed, I'm changed, I am saved. I am saved. I believe the television, the thousands of you have also been saved. And congratulations. I want you to write, Brother Swaggart, and I want you to tell them in your own words what happened to you. And I want to send you this book entitled, There's a New Name Written Down in Glory. We hope that you've enjoyed this message. For further information and to discover other sermons, visit us at ChristianSermonsOnline.com.